lift your hands and say, I depend on you. Lord, I depend on you. I depend on you. I depend on you. My life depends on you. The wisdom at work in my life depends on you. My destiny depends on you. My understanding depends on you. The scope of my existence depends on you. You are not one of the many things in my life. You are everything in my life. Lift your voice and begin to worship Him. You are not one of the important things in my life. Oh, I depend on you. The Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Says in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Verse 7 of Proverbs says, Be not wise in your own understanding. It says, Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Proverbs chapter 3 from verse 5 to 7. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, turn away from evil. Lord, we depend on you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In one minute, I'd like you to begin to recount all the things that would have not been possible in your life without Him. It's important for you to see how relevant God is in your life. He's not one of those factors. He is the factor. Lift your voice. And say, Lord, my breath depends on you. I'm what I am by the grace of God. What I am by the wisdom of God. You are responsible for my understanding if there is any crown, if there is any glory, if there is any accolade, it belongs to you. It all belongs to you. Oh, it all belongs to you. It all belongs to you. Oh. beyond that which we have learned to do. You are that one great reason why we are what we are, where we are, doing what we are doing. You are the wisdom behind this ministry. You are the grace behind our exploits. We acknowledge you. You are the mighty one. We depend on you and we will let the world know that our success is tied to our dependence on you. Keep us in that position, O oh God, where we will never see the need to move out and do things without your presence, your guidance, your wisdom, your strength. In you we make our boast all day long, for without you we are nothing and we can do nothing. Lord, we give you praise. Thank you for tonight again. We are gathered in the presence of the living God. Teach us. We submit to your wisdom. O oh, great rabbi of the ages. We submit to your wisdom. Build us. Teach us the principles of the kingdom. Bless us, O oh God, and lift us up. Let us by revelation rise to levels where we will become relevant. Thank you, Jesus. We vow to give you the glory because it truly belongs to you. Hallelujah. Lord, when we give you the glory, we do not do you a favor. We do ourselves the best of favors when we give you all the glory. 
we don't do it because we are doing you a favor. It's yours. It belongs to you. And we acknowledge you. Let the name of the Lord be exalted. In the name of Jesus. Good evening everyone. Please walk up to three people. Just greet them and be seated. Sorry about the noise in the background. You make all things new. Yes, you make all things new. And I will follow you forward. Prophesy to your life. Lord, you make all people yet you make making your life of Dr. Miles Munro and um, the Bahamas Faith Ministry International. Hallelujah. He passed on to glory together with his wife in a plane crash. Praise the Lord. And um, it's very sad because Dr. Miles has been the pivot of the revelation of the kingdom life in my life and destiny. One book that I read discovering your purpose your potentials i read that book and i made a vow that i was going to affect my generation and he's one man that i have come to love he has mentored my life he has changed my mindset and um, part of my goals for next year was to have a personal session with him and so it broke my heart badly when i heard he had gone to be with the lord but one thing Dr. Miles said in his lifetime, he said the greatest tragedy on earth is not death, but a life without purpose. I can tell you that he died empty. He released his mindset in books and he set up institutions that will continue his ideologies. I was teaching the School of Ministry students yesterday and um, were considering a course called Personal Transformation. And we're examining the concept of life how that it is not so much about the amount of time you spend in your life as it is about the quality of the impact that you make 
first advancing the purposes of the kingdom and then being a blessing to humanity. He consulted for governments. One man who was able to create the balance between the secular realm and the spiritual realm. He stood as a bridge and blessed both realms without compromise. And one of the last messages that he preached before he died was how to die effectively. He taught men how to die. These are men who have cheated death. He encouraged everyone when he went to preach in Kenya. He challenged them to disappoint the grave. Because according to Dr. Miles, the richest place in the earth is not the gold mine in South Africa, nor the oil wells in Nigeria and Iraq, the Middle East, but graveyards where potentials have gone unused. Books that would have changed destinies. Anointings that would have liberated nations. And miles before his death, and all through his lifetime, it became his conviction. And he said, disappoint the grave. Disappoint the grave. And although it was a tragic event, but he had already prepared to cheat death long. The Bible says, so then teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Can we rise in one minute and pray for Cairo and Carissa? two children he left behind, well trained, well schooled, and pray for the Bahamas Faith Ministries International. Go ahead and pray in one minute. Comfort them, O oh God. Indeed, the world has felt the exiting of a general. Generals in the faith. These are men that Hebrews 11 says the earth is not worthy of. They came with ideologies that conquered this system. They brought Babylon to its knees. They were prosperous from the earthly point of view. They were successful and yet they were relevant. Pivotal to the, the dispensational mandate of the spirit for our time. They cheated death. They reigned in life. These are men who even in the grave speak louder than those who are alive. Bless them. Lord, we thank you for giving the earth the gift of Dr. Miles and Ruth and Dr. Richard Pinder and all the membership of the Bahamas Faith Ministries International. We thank you because they took the banner of leadership and the revelation of the kingdom life to the nations. They fought the fight. They ran the race. They poured their lives like drink offerings. We are epistles and testaments and seals of their apostleships lord we thank you lord we pray that you comfort the ministry comfort the membership we pray the entire nation of bahamas in the name of jesus we pray that you will bless them all the sons and the daughters and men and women of god that he left behind i pray that they will pick up that button and run in the name of the lord jesus christ I pray that there will be no discouragement. And Lord, through his life, give us wisdom. That we who are alive will make the most of our life here on earth. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Hallelujah. I want to appreciate um, all those who made last week's service. A great time. Uh, we traveled, but God was faithful. I hear the meeting was powerful. The messages were powerful. God bless you. And the Lord increase all of us together in the name of Jesus. God is taking us far. And as always, if we submit to the dealings of the Spirit, the Bible says, surely there is an end. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Tonight, I want us to consider a very important subject. It's amazing to see that this is the 11th month of the year. And um, a lot has happened in our nation. A lot has happened in our lives. 2014 has truly been um, an amazing year for many. It's been a tragic year. And, um, but in all of these things... We thank God. 
And I want to just share with us something that I consider is very pivotal at this point of our lives. I want to share tonight on the power of hope. Very simple message, but it will bless you. The power of hope. Job chapter 6 verse 11. When we look around our world today and um, we see the complexities of, um, of living in today's world, ranging from terrorism to um, corruption and all kinds of insecurity, death, poverty, and all of these vices that have plagued our nation and our lives. And here in Nigeria, we've had our toll of the share of pain. Family members have lost loved ones. And a lot has happened in our lives. Many of us have um, had our expectations dashed at one point or the other. And it's important that we understand the concept of hope. And tonight, I know you will be blessed. When the Lord laid this in my heart, I knew that God was going to speak to us and transform our lives. Job chapter 6, verse 11. Now, when you study theologically the book of Job, um, there's a lot of controversy about the writer of the book of Job and the time, the dispensation with which the book was written. Because... Uh, contextually the book of Job seems to predate the law and all of that. We see activities in the book of Job that happened before the law was given. So we know that um, that must have existed in a dispensation that uh, most fitting would be in between the book of Genesis, somewhere around there. And theologians generally agree that the book of Job is somewhere there. The writer of the book of Job is unknown. Because of the character of that book, uh, it is generally agreed that it would take someone who is either not of human origin or who has sustained an intelligence that is out of this world to have communicated and articulated the book of Job very, very um, accurately. Because the book of Job begins telling us about a man a wealthy man who feared God and eschewed evil. And then the Bible tells us something strange. It gives us the picture of a meeting that was held in the realms of the heavens where Satan also came. And uh, discussions were made about this man called Job. And the Lord said, Have you considered my servant Job? And Satan said, Yes, I have considered him and all of that. But does he serve you just for nothing? You have blessed him. Everything he has touched has prospered. And he said, permit me to take all that you have given him and see if he will not curse you to your face. And whilst that is happening, Job was on the earth realm, not knowing that there was a deliberation that was going on. So, it's a very interesting book because uh, it's one book that tries to answer the question of why bad things happen to good people. Have you heard that kind of question? <laughs> why do bad things happen to good people? Why do Christians die? Why, why do we have terrorists come into a church or a meeting and bomb it? Why? What is the contemplation? What is the answer? There are so many things that happen in our world that creates a lot of questions. No wonder we have people who were once Christians and then as a result of these unanswered questions, they become atheists or they turn and begin to mock God and do all kinds of things. So Job was that man. In one day, brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us that Job lost his sons. He lost his daughters. He lost his houses. He was into real estate. He was into agriculture. He lost his business. He lost everything. The only thing that Job had was himself, his health, and his wife. Within a span of a few hours, men kept coming to bring reports. I was standing and there were hailstones and this and that happened. All your children are dead. I'm the only one who is alive to come and testify. And while he was trying to manage the psychology that comes, the shock, another news comes. 
This and that was happening and your cattle and everything. And, and at the end of Job's life, uh, after that news, Job gave glory to God and that was the end of it. And then, you would think that that would be the end of it. Another meeting was held again. And this time around, Satan comes and God is making boast with Job. And Satan says, well, a man can give anything but his health, his life. Permit me to touch his body and see what happens. And the Lord said, fine. Now, that in itself is a big subject of controversy. Why the Lord would permit the devil to go and buffet a man. Hallelujah. And then all of a sudden, Job began to have soil, uh, uh, boils all over his body. And within a short time, that great celebrity, that great man, was reduced to ashes. He sat upon ashes, and the Bible says dogs would come and lick his sores. He became a subject of embarrassment. Everybody in the city carried their opinion about him. And then the Bible tells us that three men came, really four. And they came and sat together. When they saw Job's predicaments, they were shocked. And for seven days, they could not talk. After seven days, they began to analyze. They stretched their intellect from border to border. Searching what principles of life might have been violated to be responsible for this man's predicament. Are you following me now? And at the end of it, they said, Job, all we can find is that you are a sinner. And Job said, be careful. Don't bring a curse upon yourself. And there was a little boy who sat. Elihu said, I wanted to speak, but I was afraid because I was little. He said, this matter is not just the issue of experience. There is a spirit in man. We need the Holy Ghost to help us. To be able to analyze what would have been the situation. And after all of those conversations, Job's wife looked at him and said, Mr. Man, you know I've been there. We had all these children with you. I've been a faithful wife. Your situation is pathetic. I pity you. So here is the solution. My recommendation to this situation is that you curse God and die. And Job said, why do you speak like one of these foolish women? Hallelujah. And then a lot of things transpired. At a point, Job's humanity, this is the part that, that I want you to get. Job, because you see, Job was a human being. And remember, I did a teaching one time on the four living creatures. How that there are four faces of creatures in the throne. The first is the face of a lion. Hallelujah. And it depicts the believer as a king, as royalty, because we are a reflection of God. So that is the dimension of God that we must permit to be at work in our lives. Mighty king, you rule and you reign. And then the face of a calf. And it symbolizes the servanthood of God expressed in the person of Jesus which should be a template for our own lives. How that is not enough just to be a boss and a king, but we must also be servants. Hallelujah. And then the third face is the face of a man, which represents our humanity. And that means no matter how mighty we are, times will come in our lives when our humanities will speak. Are you getting what I'm saying? The Bible tells us that Jesus was hungry. And he went to the farm to go and get something. In fact, at a point he came to see a fig tree. And then he didn't find food. We see the humanity of Jesus. He wept at funerals. Uh, he was grieved when he saw men doing a lot of things. Perverting the temple. There was nothing embarrassing about his humanity. And at times in our lives, sometimes we tend to choke ourselves by refusing to allow our humanities to speak. Let me just stop by to say it's okay to cry. There are times that even great men cry. It's not a symbol of weakness. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And so Job's humanity, he was trying to hold it. He said, no, nobody should, should accuse God. God is faithful. Though he slay me, I will praise him. God is faithful. Don't accuse him. But as the situation became prolonged, the Bible says hope deferred can make the heart weary. Job began to ask questions. Lord, I have defended you in the midst of my pain. Is this how you are going to allow me? I would have gotten married if I compromised. But Lord, I'm getting to 35. What is happening? 
every time people wanted to speak against you, I defended you. Even when I did not understand why my situation was happening. When my elder brother died, I defended you. A few months later, my younger brother died. I still defended you. And now someone is sick in my family and may die. Where are you? Times can come in our lives, listen to me, when our humanities will probe God and will demand explanations. The power of hope. Are you getting blessed? So Job was alone and he began to summon God. In fact, he was angry. And he said, Lord, I'm a righteous man, you know, paraphrasing. I have walked blameless before you. What is all this thing? Why is I demand you? At a point in time, his aggression began to get stronger. And he said, Lord, come down. I, I schedule a meeting with you. If you are faithful and you are just, if your mercies are new every morning, except I have been lied to all my life, please show up. I need answers. There are times when people have locked themselves not to pray for power, not to pray for grace, but to say, Lord, can you tell me why this happened? Why was my father sacked? I know that my father has never been part of those manipulating a lot of things. Why do I see ungodly people prospering? Yet for every time I serve you, I seem to pay a price for it. Hallelujah. And Job said this. Mm. He said, what is my strength? This was a communication of a man's frustration. The humanity of Job was speaking. The Bible says he feared God. That means it was not intentional. There are times, brothers and sisters, that life can push you. And you will make some statements sometimes that you will have to go back and say, Lord, I'm sorry. You will make statements. Someone sent me a text. I think he lost his mom. And um, he sent me the text two days before that time. He said, please pray. Something is wrong. Pray. I, I think a guy or a lady. I don't know exactly who. And then one morning I was on my way to travel. And then I got the text. He said, she's dead. He said, I will never trust God again. God is not to be trusted. Now you would easily say, no, don't say that. Sometimes the best way to help people is to keep quiet. If God is not angry at that statement, you should not be. The Bible says he knows that we are dust. Hmm. Hallelujah. And so Job was frustrated. And he spoke, he said, where is my strength that I should hope? And what is my end? that I should prolong my life. In other words, is it not better for me to die? What good is it now I'm alive? I can't do anything. I can't make money again. My reputation has been dashed to the ground. Everything I have lived for, I have spent my entire life for, is gone. And all I have is untold pain. I'm lying in the dust and dogs Dogs who would not even come into my compound have now become my companions and they come to lick my sores. I have become a parable in my own city. And so Job was communicating his frustration. Something happened in chapter 14 of the same Job. Verse 7 and 9, please. Chapter 14, verse 7 and 9. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Chapter 14. Oh, hallelujah. I love the Bible. Job 14, verse 7. Okay, let me just stand here. Job 14. You can just turn so that you can save time. Hallelujah. Okay. I'd like us to read verse 7. Everyone. It was the same Job speaking. Mm. Listen, listen. Let me tell you something powerful about, about, look at me. Do you know there is a technology that God has put in man? Every time, this is how it works. At first, 
we are always afraid. There are things we are afraid of. Are you getting my point? There is a way you interact with your fears such that you no longer fear again. This is a committed and passionate book project by Apostle Joshua Selman in order to reach more souls, make his messages accessible across borders, and give more people opportunities to participate in the transformation through the Word of God. Everything that has been written in this book is only meant to be used for informational purposes. Now let's get into the book. How to Know God Read by Brother Abel Imagine someone walks up to you and say, I want to know God, help me as a leader in your church, what is the first step that you do? What are you going to tell that person? You may tell the person, go to church, but the question is, do what there? Imagine he is coming from a church, yet telling you, I want to know God, I feel an emptiness in me and I am tired of playing religion and doing all religious activities. How does a man know God? What is the pathway? Who is he? Where is he? There are many frustrated people in many cities, and if we don't do something about it, people will start being vocal about the annoyance and this nuisance they believe to be Christianity. The generation of our parents is loyal people, even if they don't believe, they just continue. But this is an enlightened generation. Someone will stand up and will post just one question on the internet dash, who is God? and it will start trending and a thousand people will go to hell because no correct Christian will be able to answer, it will become galore of ignorance. Who is God? Why should I know Him? Do I really need Him? Is it because of hellfire? Or is it because it is the entrance to the church? Or is it a way of honoring the membership of a man of God? Every error or imbalance has an origin. It first starts as an opinion, and then the opinion is institutionalized. Then a time will come that opinion becomes a doctrine. We are going to lose a generation if we don't know how to mentor people to know God. Have you paid attention recently to the hatred teenagers have for God? An average teenager has technology as the new God, they truly hate God. There is a proposition that their age range has given their minds that made them hate God and they are very outspoken about it. Knowing God is more than an impartation, an impartation will not reveal God to you, it can transfer some dimension of spiritual power, but your stability in this kingdom, strength, is in knowing God. There are officially from scripture, four platforms that are provided for the believer, human, and saints to know God. It is impossible to know God outside of these boundaries. You cannot know God anyhow, there is a methodology, there are coordinates and boundaries of knowing God. Generally speaking, the Word of God defines the boundaries of God's commitment to man. It is true that God wants to prosper you, His compassion responds to your situation but His hand is limited by the coordinates provided for by His Word. So if He really wants to help you, His compassion will shift you to the place where His Word can guide you. If you don't know God there are certain risks that you cannot take in life because human beings can't take that risk. You cannot walk on water until you know God that sends you, you cannot stand before Pharaoh, Pharaoh will ask you who sends you. It is only the people that do know their God that can take such risks. These risks are compared in a season called life, your entire life will expose you to risks that humans should not take. So it's only your knowledge of God that will bail you. Abraham come out of your father's house into a land that I will show you Abraham, take now only thy son, that thou loveth, what if God was lying? It is risky to play some games with destiny believing it was God. You need to know God, you can empty your account believing it is God, only to find out that it is not God. How to know God? Number 1. The Scripture, the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3 verses 15. The first way provided for the saints to know God is Scripture. Whether you are from any other religion, once you come into saint life, the first way you begin to know the God of heaven is through scripture. 2 Timothy 3 verse 15 And that from a child that hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make the wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. 
3.16 All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 3.17 That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. John 1 verse 6 There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. 1. 7 The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. 1 colon 8 He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. 1 colon 9 That was the true light, which lighted every man that cometh into the world. 1. 10 He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. The word word in Greek means logos. Logo does not just mean the thoughts of a man, it means the ideas and contemplation of a man that is seeking out expression. So when the Bible says scripture represents the word of God, it means the thoughts and thinking of God that God wants people to know. The word of God allows us access to know what is in the mind of God that seeks to find expression. Believers grow in this kingdom through their access to scripture. The first thing you learn in scripture is the character of God. You know who a man is by his character. The character of a man is also a representation of the essence of that man. From scripture, we know the methodologies of God, that means how God does things. In the Old Testament, they did not know God, so they attributed everything to God. The moment a thing happened that was higher than three-dimensional realm, they said it was God. But when Jesus came as the manifestation of God in the flesh and then he began to correct those perceptions. We use the Bible to correct our perceptions about God that has been proposed by culture, our pain and situation. Your situation is too small to draw a conclusion about who God is. Your life has not been vetted enough, but the word of God has been tried seven times. The word of God is a valid representation of the character of God. God is vulnerable, he has a soft spot. There is something a man can tell God that will make him change his mind. Ask the man David, ask Moses. Do you know God to the extent that although you know that your father killed people, but that there is something about the mercy of God? Do you know God that much to not be threatened by yesterday? The Bible says the Lord is gracious and compassionate, he is slow to anger. That means it takes time, the God of the Bible does not get angry over all you say, no, he is slow to anger. When it looks like God is against men, they have tracks of decades of rebellion, in spite of his proposing his mercy and a way out. Fear and love cannot go the same way. The more you claim to know God the more your fear is growing, it's not supposed to be, something is wrong. The fear of the Lord used does not mean terror, perfect love casts out fear. The Bible tells us that the character of fear is that it torments and God wants your mind to be garrisoned with his peace. It is not a license for a careless and wayward life. When the little children were forbidden to come to Jesus, he rebuked them and said, Let the little children come to me, do not forsake them, for such is the kingdom of God. They sustain the teachability that the kingdom requires. You don't read the Bible just to be admired or cram scriptures and ease yourself from the guilt of backsliding, but you read the Bible so that you will become it, so that you will become the expression of it. The apostles called them living epistles. No man should come to you and make you feel limited by your background once you find out the character of God through the scripture. Truly you might come from a family buffeted by curses and yokes, but it is written in the Bible that in the character of God, there is a system where he can translate you. There is a time in your life when you should engage the truth that sets you free, but that time is not forever, there should be an exact time where defeat has been thrown away and you walk in victory experientially. To know him means to understand his character, as revealed from scripture. Historically there was no compendium of 66 books like we have now as the scripture, so this is God's effort to see that we know him. He made that his dealings with men historically be archived through this compendium and given to the saints. The 66 books as it were, is not all that Jesus said and did. The Bible said in John 20 that many miracles Jesus did in the presence of his disciples were no recorded, that these were recorded so that you might believe and in believing that you will have eternal life. So the scripture was given because it is enough to know God. Number 2. 
to his names. Exodus 3 verses 15. Exodus 3 verse 15, And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Exodus 3 verse 16 Go, and gather the elders of Israel together, and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you, and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. Exodus 3 verse 1 7 And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Parasites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Exodus 3 verse 18 And they shall hearken to thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt, and ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us, and now let us go, we beseech thee, three days journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. The names of God contain revelation about different dimensions of him. A man can know God by knowing his names. The names of God in the Bible are not just Greek and Hebrew names, they are representations of realms and dimensions. The way they gave God names in the Bible was that every encounter they had with God was a revelation of a dimension of Him that they had never seen, and every time they saw that dimension, they were compelled to capture that dimension in a name. God hid His power to reproduce that dimension in that name. So every time you invoke that dimension, the power that is made for that possibility is released in that name. For instance, the power to prosper is in Jaira. When you catch the revelation of the name Jaira, in it is the power that prospers men. The name Rapha contains in it a dimension of God that can cause him to arise with healings in his wings. The God of Abraham is not the God of Isaac in terms of the dimensional operation. If you know only the God of Abraham, the result of Isaac will not come to you. The God of Isaac is not the God of Jacob in terms of the dimensional operation. Every generation has an assignment that before they exit the earth, they must add to the names of God. That means our generation must give God a name that our children must know. The experience of knowing God was ongoing, it was never expected to stop. They are names that we got today, they are consistent with the scripture but he was never called them. They are names we have given God today that represent God as a fast worker, a quick and powerful God. You are not a blessing if your life does not give God names. When Jacob was having an encounter with God, he was on the journey to giving God names throughout his life. There was God of Abraham and God of Isaac, no God of Jacob yet, and Jacob said, I must give God an experience. By the time Jacob was old, there was a God of Jacob. The Bible Psalm 24 Psalms 24 verse 3 Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? Psalms 24 verse 4 He that hath clean hands, and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Psalms 24 verse 5 He shall receive the blessing from the Lord, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Psalms 24 verse 6 This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Which means Jacob has become a name that represents encounter. So every time God wants to give you encounter, you need the name of the God of Jacob. Jacob met with God in the night and refused to let the angel go even when the day breaks, it shows you how to have an encounter. There is something about shame and the power of God overcoming shame that your life can capture and give God a name that will allow you to mentor people, that every time shame is coming to your life. That name can be a song, a conviction, or a creed, not necessarily a word. Do you have a name? When challenges rise and threaten you, what name or song can you sing? The psalmist calls God his light and salvation. In Psalms 3 he calls God several names my shield, my glory, and the lifter of my head. F. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that set themselves against me round about. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that set themselves against me round about for thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. My glory, the lifter of my head. 
There are times that your all life will be in shame and reproach. That is not the time to sing songs and dance around. There is a name you need to find for God in that kind of shame and pain. That is why the Bible says sing unto the Lord a new song, which means let your experience cause you to sing something about God. God has a personal name called Yahweh. When you call him other names such as Waymaker, then he will come in the dimension of a Waymaker. Jesus looked at Peter and asked, Who do people say I am? Amid several names he was given, Peter said I know who you are, you are Christ the Son of the living God. When John saw him in heaven, he had so many names that he didn't hear on earth, that he is a rider upon the white horse, whose sword is not in his hands but comes from his mouth, whose name is not written on a badge but on the tide and his name is the word of God. John started seeing God's new names, faithful, true. Nobody ever called God love until John called that dimension. Paul looked at him and called him righteousness. Study the names of God, in it you find the dimension that your breakthrough needs, the dimension that can lift you. God is called quick, he is called powerful. There are different doors that are shut in your life, you need to know the names of God, they are keys to opening those doors. For every dimension of God barren in your life means you have not gotten the name. There is a name of God that brings power to a man's life. There is a name that represents an encounter with God that takes away mediocrity. No place on earth will have the power to reject you when you have and know that name. He told Jeremiah that I have set you above thrones, above dominions, above kingdoms, and Jeremiah believed it. There are names anybody can call God and he will honor them. There are names only Christians can call. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. There are names that any unbeliever can invoke and call God and he will show up, because those names speak about his mercy, those names do not talk about him being the God of the Christians. It's the name 